It's Friday, October 15th. This is episode 211 of Stand Up. Joining me today, the great professor of journalism, Jeff Jarvis, and comedian, cultural commentator, Christian Finnegan. I am Pete Dominic. Time to stand up with me right now. Yes, here we are together again. Thank you for joining me, for being with me, for supporting me, if you are, with a paid subscription. Just you listening is supportive. Always good to have the numbers of podcast downloads going up, and that's been the case. So thank you. Awesome show for you today. Lots to talk about. At the dueling town halls last night. We had Chris Christie coming out and saying, hey, this, this COVID thing is, is bad. I was in the ICU for seven days. Isn't it great when a politician has to experience something before, has to have that issue touch him or her personally before they do something about it, take it seriously? Screw you, Chris Christie. We heard a lot about this story from the New York Post being censored by... I, I shouldn't be using the censor, as Jeff Jarvis tells me later on in our conversation. But uh, taking down a story that the New York Post had been reporting because the story is not true and uh, a, a huge a huge scandal because now some people are saying that Russia actually planted the story. It's a very important thing to watch as the outrage about social media begins and you had the Senate Judiciary Committee voting to subpoena the CEO of Twitter over a site's decision to restrict tweets and, and retweets about the story. Uh, is that that controversial? I talk about that with Jeff Jarvis. Also, Two in Kamala Harris's camp have tested positive for COVID, and there now is a curfew in Paris, which is a troubling sign for COVID in Europe. A new curfew went into effect in Paris and eight other metro areas in France. A friend of mine in Paris said everybody's going out to party because it was the uh, last night before the curfew started. So that's great. That's great. Just have one more big gathering before y'all go quarantine now with the virus the curfews are going to run 9 p.m to 6 a.m for weeks and apparently the virus is everywhere in france according to president emmanuel macron so not getting any better on the pandemic front and buckle in strap in get ready for another year of social distancing and quarantining and isolating in place because that may be what it takes it is not something I wanted to say into this microphone or believe, but it's something that we're going to have to continue to discuss and for that reason do our best to stay connected to each other and not lose focus on our own reality, our own sanity. I have a lot of concern about the depression and the anxiety and the real unraveling that this is creating for people. So let's keep talking here amongst our community, which is exactly what is happening for subscribers to the Stand Up community on the Discord platform, which more people are joining every day. You have to be a subscriber to join, but it's interesting to see the conversation that's taking place there where one person, I'm forgetting who wrote this, but basically said, I, I thought I was just listening to a podcast that I liked. I didn't expect to have this great community of people to be in touch with as well. So I highly recommend that you check out the Discord platform and community that we've created there and subscribe to Stand Up if you haven't already. Speaking of which, a quick shout out to new subscribers in, I think, the last, this is really the last 48 hours Charles Roberts uh, signed up for a $10 subscription. Did I already say Charles' name last time? Well, maybe you get uh, a double plug, Charles. Thank you very much. I'm not sure where I left off on the thank yous for new subscribers on the last time I've done this was two episodes ago. John Andrew Goldberg just subscribed for $10 as well. Thank you, John. That's awesome. Welcome to the community. Thank you for joining us. We've got T.R. Dunstan is his name. T.R., with a $10 subscription. Thank you very much, TR. And Bailey Chase signed up for a $5, 
subscription, as did Pete. Pete C. Pete, thank you. Good to meet you in the hangout the other night at the book chat with Kennedy Davis. Pete was there. And Gigi Gerben, also with a $5 subscription. Thank all of you for subscribing to Stand Up. I highly recommend that you check out the Discord community. Join up there. Or if you just want to support this podcast because it costs a lot to produce every single day, that's fine, too. You don't have to be a part of any conversation or community. It's just another bonus as a listener that you get when you support the podcast. All right. So, last night you had the dueling town halls. A lot of controversy over the fact that NBC even was hosting a town hall. I particularly uh, am outraged because I would like to see more criticism coming from the on-air high-profile MSNBC types, many of which I know well because... I think that they should have the ability and they should even be encouraged by their bosses to criticize the decisions that are made if they if they want to. You don't want to go public and criticize every single decision, but one is consequential as this. I think that you should and I think that they should. And I think that my criticism of Sirius XM didn't when they brought Steve Bannon back didn't ingratiate me with the executives that I had otherwise really excellent relationships with. So I'm not saying that's the reason they didn't renew my contract, but it didn't help me. But sometimes you have to speak your truth, and that's how you get through the night. That's how you look at your kids in the face, look at yourself in the mirror. I mean, I, I just I'm disappointed to not hear more criticism. But nonetheless, I did tune in to it on NBC because I have to. I want to. I want to pay attention to what this president says. Not every tweet, not every speech, but as much as I can. And I saw a lot of Joe Biden as well over on ABC. And interesting, the massive difference between the two. But Vox.com is a great website, great news site, a lot of smart people over there. Had five winners and three losers from the dueling Trump-Biden town halls. Winner, Savannah Guthrie. Loser, Trump, they say. The dueling town halls between Trump and And Joe Biden created a stark contrast between the two candidates, but probably not the one the president wanted. This is all because Trump refused to do Thursday's planned virtual town hall debate due to his COVID-19 diagnosis. So Biden decided to schedule a solo town hall on ABC at 8 p.m. East. Trump, looking to counter-program Biden, convinced NBC to schedule his own town hall at the same time, hoping to win the ratings war and come out looking stronger than Biden. But they write at Vox, Trump may regret that strategy. He faced hard questions from voters and NBC host. Savannah Guthrie on issues ranging from wearing masks to electoral fraud to Trump's refusal to disavow extremist groups. Meanwhile, Biden's town hall was calm, polite, packed with policy substance. Biden laid out plans for how he'd get COVID-19 under control and reorient the economy toward being more equitable for lower income Americans. Two things Trump has not accomplished for voters yearning for a return to some sense of normalcy. Biden hit all of the right notes. So that is just a little bit of the Vox article recapping what occurred last night in the dueling town halls. And it was interesting to see conservative linguist and Republican strategist Frank Luntz tweeting, trigger alert, I'm about to say something that will upset many people reading my Twitter feed tonight. My group of undecided voters say that the more Trump speaks, the worse he looks. Yeah, he doesn't do himself any favors. He desperately needs a win. He needs a positive news cycle. He needs some kind of good news about COVID, about the economy, anything. And he's getting nothing, and he's getting nothing but bombs because every time he talks, he looks terrible, sounds terrible. And back to that Vox article, they write, if the town hall format brought out Biden's strengths, his ability to empathize with voters, his long experience with and knowledge about policymaking, it brought out Trump's weaknesses in the same areas. His event served to remind us that his presidency has been four years of chaos and conflict with too little in the way of substance done to help ordinary Americans in an especially difficult time in our history. Trump is trailing badly in the polls. and He desperately needed a strong performance to try to turn things around. This seems, if anything, more likely to make that hole a bit deeper. That is over at Vox.com with a recap of the dueling town halls. And I just wanted to play a few clips for you, give my reactions to them. If you don't want to hear Trump, if you're all trumped out, I get it. I highly recommend you jump ahead to my conversation with Christian Finnegan, 
who we talked about, some of the cultural stories of the week, including Ice Cube and Rudy Giuliani's daughter saying don't vote for Rudy Giuliani and more. And then, of course, Jeff Jarvis and I talk about this NBC, MSNBC decision and other politics, journalism, COVID and more. Uh, both those interviews conversations are excellent. I'm psyched to have both of them on the show today. But back to the dueling town halls. Let me play for you a few clips from Trump on NBC with Savannah Guthrie. Oh, wait, before that, here is uh, President Trump in Minnesota last night with this pathetic moment that will not be forgotten and probably has been seen or heard millions and millions of times already. I ask you to do me a favor. Suburban women, will you please like me? Remember? Please. Please. I saved your damn neighborhood, okay? Oh, you didn't save anybody's neighborhood. And how pathetic is that? Suburban women, will you please like me? No, no. They, they, I mean, there's a lot of dumb suburban women voters that voted for Trump, uh, but he didn't, he didn't turn any of them in the last four years, I don't think. I mean, really, he's only made shit worse for everybody. That's just why he has to plead to them. I mean, God, women in general don't like the guy because he's such a creep. All right. Well, my case sample of women are completely detest him and find him an absolutely reprehensible monster of a human being. So just him asking, ooh, it was so rough, so cringy, even for his standard. And so Savannah Guthrie got made some news when she asked the president about his taxes. And basically you hear him in this clip admit that, yeah, he's in debt, like, a lot. He doesn't even deny it. And then he uses a term that he means to say, I'm pretty positive, I looked this up, under leveraged, but he said under levered. And I mean, he asks Savannah Guthrie if she knows what that means. He doesn't know what it means. He's using the wrong word. And it's really, again, he's such an idiot. He doesn't even know the terminology of real estate and finance, which is where he's supposed to be a wizard. Here's that moment from the NBC town hall that should not have happened last night. Doral, big stuff, great stuff. I'm very under, when I decided to run, I'm very under levered, fortunately, but I'm very under levered. I have a very, very small percentage of debt compared, in fact, some of it I did as favors to institutions that wanted to loan me money. $400 million compared to the assets that I have, all of these great properties all over the world, and frankly, the Bank of America building in San Francisco. I don't love what's happening to San Francisco. Well, do I hear you right? It sounds like you're saying Avenue, $400 million biggest, isn't that much. One of the biggest office buildings. But are you, are, you, are you confirming that, yes, you do owe some $400 million? What I'm saying is that it's a tiny percentage of my net worth. That sounds and like, And you'll yes. see that soon because we're doing things, you know. And you'll see that soon because we're doing big things and strong things. And no, you're not. And people see right through the fact that you have no idea what the hell you're talking about. And there's no things that you're doing. And I wish that people would press you more on the things that you're doing that you haven't done. I mean, he got asked about DACA. He got asked about uh, the Affordable Care Act. And he just said, we're doing things. We're getting things done. No, you're not. You're, you're getting nothing done. Nothing more than creating a massive collective nightmare for us each and every day. And I cannot wait until election night when hopefully, and let's not get complacent, he is voted out in a landslide before midnight and I have uh, a, a big drink and a big party online with all of you all night long. All right, let me play one or two more clips here. And this is Trump being asked about his white supremacy, which, of course, he's denounced many times. He should not be asked to denounce it any, anymore. There should be a more specific question, as I say, on the back end of this horrible moment. And be watching you on a debate stage right now. We're not doing that, so let's clear up a few things from the last one. You were asked point blank to denounce white supremacy. In the moment, you didn't. You asked some follow-up questions. Who specifically? A couple of days later, on a different show, oh, you, you, you denounced white this. supremacy. No, you My question this. to you is, you, you've done this to why me does and everybody, it seem like... I denounce white supremacy, okay? You did I've two denounced days later. white supremacy for years, but you always do it. You always start off with the well, question. You didn't ask Joe Biden whether or not he denounces Antifa. I watched him on the same basic show with Lester Holt. And he was asking questions like Biden was a child. 
Well, well so th- this so is a little bit ready? of a dodge. Are you, wait, are you listening? I denounce white supremacy. Okay. What's your next question? Do you feel, it, it feels sometimes you're hesitant to do so. Like you hesitant. wait a bit. Here we go again. Every time, in fact, my people came, I'm sure they'll ask you the white supremacy question. I denounce white supremacy. Okay. And frankly, you want to know something? I denounce Antifa and I denounce these people on the left that are burning down our cities that are run by Democrats who don't All know right, what they're doing. While we're denouncing, let me ask you about q and All right, hold on a second. I just have a couple quick things to say. First of all, it's a dumb question to ask. He has denounced white supremacy many times. There's so many other ways to explain it. He should she should just ask him, how does he feel about systemic racism? He's stumbled through answers to that question many times. So I'd start there. Ask him, is he a white nationalist? Don't ask him to denounce it. Does he think white people and black people have equal opportunity? Things like that. Ask for some nuance. Don't have him just say, I denounce something. That's weak. Now, also, the comparison between white supremacy and Antifa, he pivots there all the time, and that's ridiculous, pathetic, stupid, and makes zero sense. Everybody knows that this country has a history of white supremacy. Everybody knows that. Antifa is not a thing. There's no history of it. It is not a, even it, it, vaguely a problem. There has been some vandalism. By some people who claim to have certain sets of beliefs, there's no organization, there's no leaders of Antifa, there's no major Antifa movement. And what Antifa, by the way, actually is, in the worst case scenario, is anarchy, which isn't necessarily something that is morally reprehensible. My brother is an anarchist, and it is, in the best case, anti-fascist. We should all be anti-fascist. So the idea that he pivots from white supremacy, which are terrorist organizations which have have existed in this country for as long as this country has existed and which continue to be a major problem and which the FBI and every national security agency looks at when they look at the domestic threats as the biggest problem, white supremacists. So finally, the comparison between white supremacy and Antifa is a terrible thing to do and she should have been able to push back on that better. Always easy to criticize the interviewer, the moderator. I know I'll always do a better job. You'll always do a better job than I will answering a question or arguing with someone. I get it. So given that now she asks him about QAnon and this is a great question, an important question. I think Savannah Guthrie does a good job here, despite the fact that this town hall never should have happened. I think she does uh, pretty good here. Listen to this down our cities that are run by Democrats who don't right, know what they're doing. While we're denouncing, let me ask you about QAnon. It is this theory that a, uh, Democrats are a satanic pedophile ring and that you are the savior of that. Now, can you just once and for all state that that is completely not true so and disavow I know, QAnon yeah. in its entirety? I know nothing about QAnon. I just told I you. I know very little. You told me, but what you tell me doesn't necessarily make it fact. I hate to say that. I know nothing about it. I do know they are very much against uh, pedophilia. They fight it very hard, but I know nothing they about it. They believe it, it is if a satanic like call to run by the deep state. The subject, I'll tell you what I do know about. I know about Antifa, and I know about the radical the left, and I know how violent they are and how vicious they are, and I know how they're burning down cities run by Democrats, not run Republican by Republicans. Republican Senator Ben Sass said, quote, QAnon is nuts, and real right. leaders call conspiracy theories conspiracy theories. He may be Why right. not just say it's crazy and not true? He may be right. I just don't know about QAnon. You do know. I don't know. No, I don't know. I don't know. You Let me ask me you another thing. Let's- okay, so here's the thing. She was right to say you do know because we know that he does. But she can't prove that in that moment. So the question is, how can you not know? This is a major threat according to your own leaders in your own national security agents. Everybody knows a little bit about QAnon. But those in government should know a lot about QAnon. That's your job. So the question is, how can you not know? That's malpractice. That is a complete disregard of your responsibility as a leader. This is a movement that has reached across the globe now that is horrific damage 
to so many different communities, societies, and countries, and democracy as a whole. And the beliefs they have are terrible. So when he says, I don't know if you're making that up, she should just say, even if I were, have you, do you think, do you think, that the Democratic Party is running pedophile rings. Have you have any belief on that? Anyway, yes, I would have done that better. And sorry to be critical uh, again, but that was a very important exchange. And obviously I've been concerned about conspiracy theories forever. And now they are here and he continues to spread them, as he did when he tweeted about a conspiracy theory about the assassination of of Osama bin Laden, which she also asked about. And this is a horrible moment for President Trump, which, of course, begged the question, why would he subject himself to this? Waste the whole show. Uh, you start off with white supremacy. I denounce it. You start off with something else. Let's go. Keep asking me these questions. Okay. I but, do have one more. Let me, just, let me just tell you what I do hear about it is they are very strongly against pedophilia. And I agree with that. I mean, I do agree okay. with that. And I agree but with it. There's not a strongly. satanic uh, pedophile. I have cult no idea. I know you don't about know that? that? Okay. No, I don't know. You that. Just- Oh, so there you go. There was a little bit more of that. And I think she did a a little bit better job, but she still should have said and he somebody other reporters should say, how do you not know what your own FBI says is a very dangerous organization and movement? How do you not know that? Is that not your responsibility? That's the question to ask him. You're welcome. All right. Now to the bin Laden question. Just this week, you retweeted to your 87 million followers a conspiracy theory that Joe Biden orchestrated to have SEAL Team 6, the Navy SEAL Team 6, killed to cover up the the fake death of bin Laden. Now, why would you send a lie like that to your followers? You retweeted That was a retweet. That was an opinion of somebody. And that was a retweet. I'll put it out there. People can decide for themselves. I don't take a position. You're not like someone's crazy uncle who can just retweet whatever. That was a retweet. And I do a lot of retweets. And frankly, because the media is so fake and so corrupt, if I didn't have social media, I don't call it Twitter, I call it social media, I wouldn't be able to get the word out. And the word word is, is and you know what the word is? The word is very simple. We're building our country stronger and better than it's ever been before. Let's and that's what's happening, and everybody knows it. Okay, we you got a bunch of questions for you. We're winning in a lot of states. Okay. We're winning in a lot of states. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, no, I mean, again, I'm sorry, Savannah Guthrie. You absolutely dropped the ball on that one. Absolutely. The, 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 you're not somebody's crazy uncle. No. The pushback is, sir, you know. That is not true. Are you saying that you think there is any grain of truth to a conspiracy theory that claimed a Navy SEAL team who killed bin Laden only killed a body double? That's what he tweeted. That's what he tweeted. He knows that's not true. She has to say, sir, you know that is not true. Has anybody in your national security agency or in the military or anybody involved with that operation said anything remotely close to that being true. That's what she had to say. He's the president of the United States and he is tweeting and sharing things that are patently false and that is extremely dangerous and compromising for our national security. So Chris Cuomo over on CNN got Robert O'Neill on his show on CNN last night. Robert O'Neill is the Navy SEAL who shot and killed Osama bin Laden, who tweeted in reaction to President Trump sharing that conspiracy theory. Very brave men said goodbye to their kids to go kill Osama bin Laden. We were given the order by President Obama. It was not a body double. Thank you, Mr. President. Happy birthday at U.S. Navy. Now, the reason why there's some issue here is that this guy, Robert O'Neill, has been an outspoken supporter of Donald Trump. Anyway, here he is last night with Chris Cuomo. Who he asked to begin with, what is the reality of what happened that night? Well, the first thing I want to say is that every man that was on that mission, to include the air crew and the pilots, are all alive. Um, We we all went in there. We we all kissed our kids goodbye expecting death because of what happened on 9-11, and we were willing to do it. Um, And then just right now to see it being uh, these conspiracy theories thrown around due to politics, it's it's, it's almost like uh, it's an insult to real people who – because they bring in another uh, event <clears throat> from part of our, our uh, brothers at SEAL Team 6, where they were gold squadron that were shot down in August. 
Um, but just by doing this stuff on the internet and making such light of something like this, you're really trampling on graves of, of some of the the best heroes I've ever personally worked with. And uh, it's just a shame that we've gotten there because uh, uh, politics. Is it okay that you have to take one for the president to help him make the case that you really can't trust anything these days? You can just trust me. Even that SEAL team stuff with bin Laden, who knows if that happened? Well, I mean, the, the thing is, I, he can go over to the CIA anytime where there's a file cabinet with a picture of bin Laden's head and my hands are in the picture. And then we took a bunch of pictures of, of him, not only in uh, his own bedroom, but also in Jalalabad, the first place we stopped when we crossed the border and realized we were going to live. And then when we took him up to Bagram so that the uh, the three letter agencies, the people smarter than than me uh, could do all the DNA tests. And, and that's what took so long for us to confirm it that night because President Obama was waiting for the, the confirmation of how many people were left in the House. And uh, for them, for, for people to say that, uh, you know, we, we flew on the way back, we realized the DNA was wrong, we flew him into the mountains. Or speaking of conspiracies, my favorite is someone decided that Hillary Clinton sent some missiles through Qatar to shoot down SEAL Team 6 to keep us quiet. If there was a conspiracy with a body double, then they would have shot us down as we were flying out. They, they didn't even, none of the guys that were killed were on, on the bin Laden raid. And uh, just, just the way that it spins politically, and, and then for, you know, Twitter of all places, I mean, I'm, I, I personally like to use Twitter for entertainment a lot. Um, this is not the time for it. All right, former Navy SEAL Robert O'Neill on CNN with Chris Cuomo last night. Good booking for Chris. That was an interesting conversation. And just getting back finally to last night's town hall, which never should have happened, at least not at 8 p.m. And apparently they couldn't get any advertisers. They were terrified probably of being boycotted. They were mostly promoting their own stuff. But Brian Steinberg at Variety writes as a review of the debate, Savannah Guthrie kept command of NBC's controversial Trump town hall. And he writes, President Trump wanted to run and ramble. Savannah Guthrie wouldn't let him in what may be the performance of a career. The popular Today anchor kept a tight rein on the proceedings of a controversial town hall event in Miami with President Trump that put the network's parent, NBC Universal, in the crosshairs of critics and Hollywood A-listers. He goes on to write uh, in his review of Savannah Guthrie's performance as the town hall moderator. For just under 60 minutes on NBC, Guthrie held Trump to account, asking him if, in fact, he'd contracted pneumonia while infected, why he had a problem making a definitive dismissal of white supremacy, telling him he had no legal defense against the release of much much sought after tax returns and asking him to denounce conspiracy theories held by some of his backers. So Brian Steinberg at Variety thought she did a pretty good job overall. Um, I guess, I don't know, maybe I had a little bit different point of view and maybe just... uh, specifics around the way that she should have pushed back or asked questions. And obviously I take issue with the fact that NBC had it on at 8 PM opposite the ABC news town hall where Joe Biden, by the way, looked great, sounded great, did great. And I think did himself nothing but favors. And I mean, he sounded like a wonk. He sounded like he knew uh, uh, all of the facts that he was talking about. He didn't sound senile or old the way that he has been caricatured and back to reviews of uh, Samantha, Samantha, Savannah Guthrie, who, by the way, I've met a couple times. I interviewed her a couple times at Sirius XM, and she's really a, a kind and lovely person. I didn't mean anything personal uh, in my criticisms, and I really was nitpicking. But Eric Wemple at Washington Post, media critic, writes, given the backlash against NBC News for holding its Trump Town Hall now, there was an insane pressure on Savannah Guthrie to press POTUS at every step. That's exactly what she's doing to a suburb effect. Daniel Dale's fact checker at CNN writes that I'm impressed with Guthrie's preparedness so far. She's been ready for some of Trump's regular false claims. Uh, Jeff Greenfield on second thought, maybe Guthrie should just take the whole town hall. Brian Stelter at CNN Media Critic. One of the best moments of Samantha, I did it again, Savannah Guthrie's career. And uh, so a lot of people really giving her high marks. So uh, good for her then. And not good for Donald Trump, but not a good night. And his campaign, though, did put out a statement uh, which partially reads, President Trump soundly defeated NBC's Savannah Guthrie in her role as debate opponent and Joe Biden's surrogate. President Trump masterfully handled Guthrie's attacks and interacted warmly and effectively with the voters in the room. So 
I already read you Frank Luntz's statement about how people saw Trump handling of it all. All right, let me get to my first guest. Shall I? Christian Finnegan is one of my favorite people to talk to. I talk to him pretty much every Friday. We go through some of the stories in the news, cultural stories as well, things that have been trending that are important to discuss. His perspective is always really welcome. People love Fridays with Christian Finnegan, who is on Twitter, at Christ Finnegan. Here is our conversation from last night. Let's get it done right now with Christian Finnegan. Who says what? that's going to be my new French, uh, catchphrase? Let's and get it done phrase. with Christian Finnegan. Let's get it done with Christian Finnegan. Uh, Chris so, Cuomo so has. I'd be like the, uh, the grammatically correct version of get her done. Get it done. Well, let's make fun of <laughs> NBC. And then, uh, yeah, you have to hold up your finger like that, too. And then let's, but let's make fun get of CNN. Get it done. CNN, <clears throat> CNN first, because I used to do a bit and always talked about how CNN has these silly kind of phrases that go with their primetime programming, um, even their regular newsroom programming, like, you know, Wolf Blitzer's Situation Room and uh, Out Front with uh, Aaron. Aaron Burnett. And she'll say, let's go out front right now with... Anderson Ugh. Cooper. Anderson Cooper, uh, his show, I think, is 360 still, maybe. He says he has a, a, a one, uh, keeping him honest, Christian. Yeah. Okay, keeping yeah. him honest now. And then finally, Chris Cuomo has, let's get after it. And they use it, and they print it on, like, T-shirts and stuff. Oh, of course. I'm sure there's many, many meetings where it's like, you're not saying get after it enough. Uh, I mean, Al Sharpton, ha- I, mean, I mean, Al Sharpton's is just a segment. Uh, he has that, like, we got you, or whatever. He's got that dumb thing that he does where it's like, you thought you could get away with it, but we got you. We hey, got you. we got you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Reverend Al. Yeah, Do those... you remember there was... Uh, They're so <laughs> they hokey. Those, it's such MSNBC a... did those promos where he talked about blueberry pie. Or no. Al Sharp. No. Blueberry I just pie. Remember... Uh, for, my... for weeks, I was saying blueberry pie. <laughs> blueberry pie. Uh, we used to anyway. talk... Uh, Alfred used to talk about the Chris Hayes riding his bike promo a lot. Apparently he was, he did a promo where he'd ride his bike around Brooklyn or something. He did a promo for yeah, a show. Like, but you, I mean, what is that? I mean, what, exactly what they think we are. <laughs> I think that stuff is bad. I think it's bad. I think news, it would be great to deliver news, like really straightforward and, it, and come on, on TV. Yeah, it would be nice to, you know, it would be nice to wake up in a, a fountain of gold coins but like as well. The, I mean, but I know, but CBC and BBC do that. PBS does that for the most part. I mean, it can be done. It's not like on TV. TV news can be done more straightforwardly unless, you know. Well, I don't know. BBC, that's not 24 hours, right? I mean, they have like news programs. But it could be. It could and be. And then regular programming. I just think, you know, when once you're into the 24-hour news cycle – then you really have to have, you know, news is no longer thought of as a loss leader. And, you know, it used to be considered that uh, that right. that was sort of the 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 honeymooners with a spoonful of sugar and Walter Cronkite was the medicine, you know, and, and that it was never nobody ever thought like, oh, the news should make our network yes, money. because it, it was, was just perfectly it was unethical it. to think so because yes. the, the ethical considerations were are so wide and and, 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 disc, and and obvious conflicts of interest. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but you're 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 literally critiquing the entirety of news consumption for the past 50 years. I, I mean, know, it, but it's, it's always it's worth all... mentioning that the bells and the whistles that they use in media that everybody does, but especially on those shows like let's get out front now with and it's, okay with your branding. So stupid. Um your email is really funny today for today's conversation. <laughs> I literally just sent it 20 Christian minutes ago, yeah. always sends, you know, things that he wants to talk about, which I love cuz I want to talk about what he wants to talk about. Of course, and today's said um, three stories that you sent. Diane fucking Feinstein with a link. Ice fucking Q with a link. And Rudy fucking Giuliani with a link. Made me laugh really hardy har just seeing it laid out that way. I'm so mad today, man. I, I'm in a really just angry mood. Uh, fine, I mean, I li- I'll, I'll take you. Now we're phone banking. You think I would have like a love in my heart for democracy. What is the phone now? banking that you did and who are you working with on that? Uh, well, honestly, you know, I did a lot more of it in 2018 In 2018, I was, I was pretty engaged. Uh, my wife, you know, owns that venue and we were doing phone banking sessions out of QED primarily for Antonio Delgado, who is the, uh, representative who won, uh, in 2018, who represents, uh, district New York 19. 
um, and also for uh, state Senator Jen Metzger. And I, you know, I, I think that they're both fine public servants. It's not like I necessarily got involved because I was swept up in a whirlwind of passion for Antonio Delgado, although I think he's a very good public servant. You find it to be um, your civic duty. Just, and- you know, we were, it was a swing district. We were represented mm-hmm. by an a-hole, John Faso. And, uh, and it was, I felt like I could make a lot more of an impact doing that kind of thing up here in upstate New York or in Sullivan County rather than in Queens where I, at the time I was mostly living. And so but, who, uh, who are you doing phone banking for now? A specific same, candidate? Same. Uh, I'm just, I'm going to be doing it for uh, New York 19 again, just because I'm, I'm familiar with how to do it. You know, I know the, the system that they use, the little how call does it, system. How does it work? You call up a person, um, you get a well, real I mean, person they, and they say, have, hi, I'm Christian. I'm sorry. You get a real person on the phone and try to convince them to, to, to make, to vote. I mean, you get a real person on the phone, one and one out of every 35 calls that you make. It's a lot of voicemails and a lot of hangups at this point. Um, and like I said, I, I just started getting engaged with this like literally today. So I'm a little behind. Um, as, and you as were telling me that you had... use this super like kind of obnoxious animated voice to open. Why do you do that? Hey, this is Christian calling from New York Democrats. Yeah, why do that? I would, I would Am be I annoyed. Speaking but... with Sally, <laughs> I might uh, think it was Sally. Uh, no, this is Bruce. You talking my wife? Yeah, I have a, a I have a wide range of uh, ethnically dubious accents that I make. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Keeps you entertained as you're banking yeah, away. You know, they, they pretty much do all the work for you. I mean, they, they you know they have a system, and you it's called a. Uh, open vbp it's a virtual phone bank um vpb rather and uh you know a name pops up and has all their information and there's basically a script with some drop downs you right. know where it's like you say and you don't have to stick to it literally but you basically go through the like hey my name is christian i'm calling from new york democrats and want to give you some important information about the election blah 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 at this point the people you're calling they're all registered democrats and most of them have you know Uh, given some indication that they are going to vote. So it's not like when I did it in 2018, I was calling people who would conceivably be like, Democrats should all die. Um, Hmm. But at this point, you're mostly, it's mostly get out the vote. It's not really about persuasion at this point. Uh, You also told me again off the air that, and I think this is also equally obnoxious, that you actually tell them some of your credits before you yeah, get into it to kind yes. of, you like, say uh, to quote, gain credibility with. Yes. I say, Hey, this is a uh, Christian. I did the John McEnroe show twice. Um, and <laughs> Chappelle show. I mean, I think that builds credibility because no, like, a lot I of like people to start with the lowest credits and work up from there. You decide what credit to give based on the age of the person you're talking to and what they're most likely to know you from. I think good point. Yeah. 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 If it's somebody in uh, a 70 or above, I say uh, I've been on the today show. <laughs> Which is true. Uh, it's and a if great it's way to under the yeah. age of thirty five, I, I maybe I'll say best week ever. You might remember my hilarious jokes about Lindsay Lohan. Oh, hi, Christian. What are you calling about? I'm a big fan. And then you get into the politics, and you uh, make funny. sure they... no one's ever said that. <laughs> you know, you as self deprecating as I tr- I am by nature, there still is that egotist part of me that wonders, like, what if somebody like says, like, Hey, are you that comedian? Even though I don't give my last name, there's no reason that they would think that. But maybe they would just hear my first name and listen to my voice and be like, oh, my God, are you that comedian? And the answer is no. No one's ever going to do that. I've fantasized about that many times. And then I'll never forget we're in Universal about Studios. My, about my name? No, it was purely about myself. Of course, uh, we were at Universal Studios in line to get on a, on a line. We were just talking, Val and I and the girls. And this guy turns around and just looks at me and his mouth is agape. He goes, are you, are you Pete Dominic? And then told me that he recognized my voice and he's been listening forever. And we sat there in line while he just shined my shoes in front of my family. And it was about the best thing in the world. I yeah. loved it. I ate it right up. I, See, I, I don't. I lapped it. I like it. I like it when somebody. Anybody else you know, here? I just started yelling. <laughs> It doesn't happen anymore, but when uh, (laughs) I would get recognized quite a bit, I like it literally as somebody's walking away. 
Oh, you don't want to engage them. You get awkward. I, you get... I don't. I get really uncomfortable mm. after about 10 seconds. Not you know, me. I'm always trying to be very appreciative. I'm not an asshole about it, but it's like I, 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 it doesn't, I don't know what to do after that first. I turn like, them against me. They start with kind of this praise, but I keep them there for so long and bore them so long. They they stop even being, they're like, I got to go. It was nice. You're to like meet running you? bits by them and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, <laughs> <laughs> Talking about really uninteresting things about my life and my, my new studio that I built. So let's get to your stories, Christian Finnegan. And I am really interested, though. It's awesome that you're doing the phone banking. And if other people listening are, I'd like to know, you know who you're doing it with and, and how you're doing it. And um, But let's talk about, first of all, Ice Cube had a rough week. And this is a story I found a little bit confusing. I wasn't quite sure uh, what he had done. But basically, Ice Cube is one of the probably most successful, well-known, both hip-hop artists and actors, producers uh, in the world. I mean, and he's, uh, I don't know how to describe, I mean, I'm sure there are some people that might not know who he is, but they they would recognize him. He's been in so many uh, films. And he's pretty ubiquitous at this point, you know, and and I happen to have been on that show with him for a long time that are we there yet? You know, uh, he was he was in the movie. Are we there yet? And then they turned it into a TV show. So uh, of which I was a cast member and he would occasionally come in. He had a he wasn't in every episode. He was probably in 20 of the 100 episodes that we did. Uh, And uh, so, yeah, I, I. I wouldn't say I got to know him because we had very little to talk about. Was he thoughtful, polite, kind? Um, was he? I mean, aloof? he was. He was. It was his production. Like his production company was in charge of it, and so you know, he, he was always incredibly professional and, and polite. Uh, and but he was always pulled in fifty different directions whenever he'd be on set. You know, and not even just with this show, but he's he's you know he's a basically a Shark Tank dude. He's got like eight different businesses going. Uh, you know, he's an entrepreneurial type dude, and so. We, there wouldn't be like a lot of just idle chit chat. There was, there were a few times where we would be on set. And I remember one time, particularly we were shooting some party scene where it was like a bunch of cast members in the room and we were all staged in our certain place. And he and I cube, as he prefers to be called, uh, were sitting on a couch and, you know, a light went out or, you know, there were some electrical problems. So there's 20 minutes, 25 minutes of, you know, uh, stage hands trying to fix things. And so we kind of were forced to attempt to have a conversation. And, you know, like I said, the dude was never anything but nice to me. I, I don't want to sound like I'm trashing him or whatever, but there's just, there's only so much about the Raiders that I know. There's, <laughs> oh, you know, no. there's just not a lot of Venn uh, diagram. Yeah. I didn't know he was a huge Lakers fan because I am more of a basketball fan. If I had thought of that, I would have been able to kind of. He know, went to the male small talk go to of sports, and you couldn't. You weren't there for. Him yeah, I just I have you know because because yeah. he's like he was always such an out front huge Raiders fan. You know, he'd always have the Raiders hat on and the black and silver colors and all that. And so I, when I was sitting there, I was like, all right, think of something, think of something. Like, what do you say to Ice Cube? Well, like, you stop. hey. How are the Raiders doing this year? It was like the only thing I could think of. And that lasted about 45 seconds. Uh, and then it was just awkward silence. Your fault. But anyway, I, I do, I, I, I'm, you know, it's always awkward for me as a white person and not just a white person, the whitest of the white people <laughs> to try to critique any black American on how they should or should not engage with our elected officials but basically, he put out this contract with Black America, basically, a you know, a, a 13 point document. He released ju- yeah. July 1st in the wake of nationwide Black Lives Matter protests, uh, a contract that urges all politicians asking for a vote from black Americans to back the plan and, quote, demand an open debate and clear and fair vote within the first 100 days of the 117th Congress in 2021 and the following proposals. And then he has these 13 points, apparently. So it's a kind of a he's a, like the Grover Norquist of uh Black folks, he's, or uh, you know, Newt Gingrich. You a, a contract? I, mean, I, don't, I don't remember. I don't remember who ever nominated. I mean, Ice Cube and NWA in general, obviously, are a landmark group in hip hop, but also in terms of social, uh, you know, I wouldn't say social awareness because they weren't really a political group so much. They were just completely unabashed and confrontational in their message, which made them political. 
Um, certainly they were the subject of a lot of political conversations, even if they weren't political in the way that say Chuck D, you know, public enemy was, but, but they saying um, fuck the police. Yeah. But the fuck the police was from a personal place of, I'm personally tired of getting fucked with the police. Police didn't hear it that way. Surprisingly. (laughs) But I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that like, I don't necessarily know who asked ice cube to step up and be the, spokesperson or the the uh the foreman of the black lives matter movement i don't remember him being a pivotal figure in that movement in any way shape or form but you know like i said it's not for me to judge but i guess he he came out with this document and according to him the biden campaign basically said get to us after the election like we can't really address this stuff until after the election and trump the trump campaign made some minor changes to their platform based on it. And so he's saying, see Trump, you know, basically fuck them all, but Trump is actually better and we don't need to be beholden to Democrats, which I know a lot of black people say, you know, the Blexit thing, which I think is mostly PR uh, crap. Yeah. That's preposterous. But according to, to me, all though, of just, the super I'm smart sorry. black folks that I listen to, but you know, it, when you hear them explaining Blexit, it's, it's really anyway. Yeah. So so Ice Cube makes this contract. So he, but the point is that what you're saying, the Biden campaign was like, Let, let's, we'll get back to you, and the Trump campaign was, yeah, we'll work with you on this, basically. Yeah, it, well, what it, you know, and it, but it's just to me, it, it's because oh, because they spoke to you, because you were elevated by the Trump campaign, all of a sudden they have risen in your esteem, whereas the Biden campaign blew you off, so therefore that has affected your. Uh, political allegiance it's like dude fuck you it's not about you it's not it's not about you there's a lot of people with a lot of plans right now and biden campaign has already put out a plan you know that that is pretty extensive about you know uh race relations and whatnot and you can say oh well it's not, none of it's going to happen or it's not strong enough and i actually agree it's not strong enough well, but to pretend that somehow you're going to get a better shake from donald trump when it comes to Police brutality. It's just come on, man. Give me a fucking break. Well, I, I, I give wouldn't, me a break. My my only point, the only thing I can think of, and again, you know, we're talking about an issue. We're white guys talking about an issue. We're cognizant of that. But let let me just quote uh, uh, some black thinkers and activists who've spoken out against the rapper Ibram Kendi who is a professor who's been on the show many times, said that Ice Cube's lying to himself before we talk truth to power, must talk talk truth to ourselves. Cube is lying to himself that he can get Trump to deliver black progress in exchange for black votes when Trump hasn't brought progress for his own supporters. The process starts, brother, by talking to yourself. Uh, Also, Brittany Cooper has been on the show, professor at Rutgers. She uh, slammed Ice Cube several times on Twitter. And now I even read a slam where she's basically saying all the black men going along with her are leaving us behind. Uh, She writes, who is the who is Ice Cube that the Democratic Party would feel the need to talk to him and about the broad political concerns of black America? Is he a political leader or organizer? No. So that's just, you know, a couple of black voices on that that I want to include in our conversation. But my my only point is you don't talk to Donald Trump or any Republican about any policy. You don't. There's no conversation until they agree to 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 make sure that there are no obstacles for black people to vote. Why even talk about policy if you're making it hard for them to vote? That's what I always say when I get in an engagement with, you know, even friends and and people who don't quite understand. I say, listen, if Martin Luther King fought for the the, these rights, the right to vote, the civil rights movement culminated in the Voting Rights Act. And then the Supreme Court, led by conservatives, gutted it. Democrats tried to restore it legislatively. Republicans won't. They are doing everything they can to prevent black people from voting. Why are we talking to them about policy? That's my rant. Over. No, one, I 100% agree. But to me, again, it's, it's the power uh, of celebrity that a celebrity, it, it's that – they want the personal acknowledgement from power because, like, but I'm Ice Cube. Why haven't you given me my due? I'm a major celebrity, and Trump did, and Biden didn't. Just in his give mind. money to the organizations and tell and do what they tell you to do. You don't need to come up with it. Yeah. You know. Um, let me ask you. We can talk about that forever, but we're we're, we're almost yeah. out of time. You have to go phone back. I know. Uh, but um, Diane fucking Feinstein. I I bend over backwards trying to defend Democrats. Sometimes people hear me and How criticize me for it. I mean, it, she made it. She she this stepped looks in bad. It this so is very bad. Hard today. What's your criticism? Well, first of all, just the fact that she's just skated through these uh, Amy Coney Barrett 
uh, proceedings as if this is a normal Supreme Court n- nominating process, as if this isn't the second seat on the Supreme Court that has been stolen, as if this isn't doesn't mean the end of Roe versus Wade and the Affordable Care Act and 50 other things that are too horrifying to even think about yet. She's just skating through, acting like everything's perfectly normal. This idea that some sort of bipartisanship in and of itself is what is important. Like, I'm sorry, man. It's just, I, I'm not trying to be ageist here, but get into the generation that we are actually living in. Stop trying to resurrect some idea of, hey, we're all friends at the end of the day and we're all going to come together. It, they, the Republicans stopped playing that game around the time of when Newt Gingrich came on the scene. And Democrats just keep wringing their hands. When I say Democrats, I mean establishment Democrats just keep wringing their hands and expect that they can just it. Well, if we're nice enough, maybe they'll stop stealing our lunch money. And then to not only do that, but then to praise Lindsey Graham as Lindsey Graham has been eating a dick for the past two weeks, going on TV multiple times a day. I'm sorry, maybe poor phrasing. Uh, I'm not trying to make a cheap shot there. But he has been eating crap for two weeks, going on TV, begging for money because he's he might actually lose his Senate race. And here's Dianne Feinstein coming in, throwing him a lifeline, praising him openly like that's not going to be in a major commercial for Lindsey Graham by the end of the week. And then on top of that, at the end of the hearing, she gives him a maskless hug. This is a guy who very well may have contracted coronavirus because he refuses to be tested. And then you are going to you're going to give them. First of all, it's just stupid, but it also completely undercuts the messaging that Democrats have been trying to put across that we have to take this seriously. So she's making it seem like it is just lip service, that it is just political. Oh, we don't actually have to be safe. That's just our political angle to this. It's not a fucking angle. It's a pandemic. Far worse than the video of Nancy Pelosi taking off her mask in a hair salon was Dianne Feinstein hugging Lindsey Graham. Absolutely. Just that physical act was terrible role modeling when so many people across the country react with, I haven't seen my elderly parent in seven months. It's always the right reaction. I fully embrace and support it. Do you have time for Giuliani? You got to jump. Oh, well, I'll just say it is always a pleasure. I, I love it when a Republican politician's family members come out against them. Uh, and his uh, his daughter, uh, Carolyn Rose Giuliani, has an article out in Vanity Fair where she's basically saying, my father is an asshole. He's always been an asshole. Please vote for Biden and Harris. Um, the article's title, not, Rudy not Giuliani is my father. Whole, Please, everyone. Huh? The article's title, Rudy Giuliani is my father. Please, everyone, vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. That's the article at Vanity Fair by Rudy Giuliani. It seems to only happen to Republican politicians. I don't recall any... Democrat running and then his family, his or her family members coming out and being like, this guy's an asshole. Like, I just don't, maybe it exists. I've never seen it. And I'm not even going to get into the whole, I mean, we don't have time for Hunter Biden and all that nonsense. But uh, there's no need to talk about that. If you're outraged yeah. by Hunter Biden and anything that he did trading on his father's name, and you're not outraged by the official capacity of the Trump family in the federal government, then you are not worthy of having uh, a conversation with or even voting. Well, you're lying. I mean, you're lying. You're being disingenuous. Uh, Christian Finnegan, thank you so much. Good luck with the phone banking. Appreciate it. Thanks, PD. Another great conversation with Christian Finnegan, who I love talking to every Friday. Give him a follow on Twitter at Christ Finnegan. Let him know you heard him on the show and that you love hearing him on the show, which several of you do. And it's always greatly appreciated. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, joining me now is one uh, another one of your favorites, the great Jeff Jarvis. He's a journalist, a professor, a television critic. He started uh, Entertainment Magazine. He worked at People Magazine. A, he was a TV guide critic at uh, a, a critic at TV Guide and People Magazine. He was the Sunday editor and associate publisher of the New York Daily News, a former columnist at the San Francisco Examiner. He's been an associate professor at City University of New York's Graduate School of Journalism now for several years. Uh, Howard Stern loves this guy. He is a regular uh, like caller on Howard. He takes him very seriously, and I love him. I love him a lot. I think he's a great guy. We always have great conversations. There was a lot to talk about from the MSNBC town hall and the way that it went down to journalism in general, to politics, and, of course, to the rise of COVID, which he follows very closely, the science and epidemiology around it. Here is my latest conversation with, on Twitter, 
Say hi to him as well, at Jeff Jarvis. I, my daughter says to me, you're picking me up at school. This is the one day that she goes to school during the week, I guess. Maybe there's two, but this week it's one. And I told her I'd pick her up today. She just reminded me. She said, you're picking me up at 3.30. I said, oh, I forgot. I have a very important guest. I, I can't move it. <laughs> That's you. I'm, I'm, I'm the excuse for your bad fathering? Boy. Boy. <laughs> Well, it's on the record, man. It's recording. Well, I told her, uh, and now it's trending, blame Jarvis. So yeah. <laughs> all her friends hate you because I was supposed to pick them up. Uh, but you're a very important person. So what do they have to do? Walk through the snow to get home? Yes, uphill the entire yeah. time without shoes because that's right. what builds character. So thank you for joining me. I have so many things that I want to talk with you about and – I have so many things I feel suicidal about, and so that's what I want to talk to you. That's well, what you, makes me feel Okay. Good. Give me your suicide list. Oh, oh, it's obvious. <laughs> I, I, I think we're going to lose. Uh, our Supreme Court justice doesn't know the basic rights. Our senators don't understand the First Amendment. Um, I don't want Kamala or, or, or Joe to be sick. Uh, and the nation is heading into something worse than we've already had. Is that enough? Yeah, those are all worst case scenarios. How how sure are you of the we're going to lose the election? I mean, well, I think that the the company line coming out today and it was in the New York Times with Ensel's column and it was elsewhere is uh, oh uh, not out of the woods. And I think that's a, a wise thing to do. I think we've got we cannot have complacency. We cannot have have people saying, well, uh, he's okay, but I don't like him that much. We just cannot bear that. And and it's not just that we have to win. We now have to win so instantly and so decisively yeah. that there's just no hope of these bozos fighting it. When you say instantly, you mean election night has to be. Uh, I think Florida, if Florida goes election night, that's because what all of the pundits will say, is there a path without Florida? There hasn't been a path without Florida. Has there? No, there hasn't been a path without Florida because they all think they're so damn smart. Um, so that's going to matter. And one or two surprises elsewhere would be good. But your point being instant, meaning there has to be no question on election night from in-person voting. And I guess I don't even know. I should know how they start to count, uh, count the mail. Florida counts, counts. Florida is fast. They're they're inefficient and they're full of shads, but they're fast. Chads, I mean. Shad I thought, row, I chad. thought a shad was a type of person uh, from Florida, <laughs> which I like. I like that. <laughs> they're people who don't believe in government or – Science or masks or uh, yeah. As far as instantly, you know, I, I get that. And then winning big, meaning there has to be such a large gap that the the public and even the right wing media can't get away with some kind of a, a, a spin that there was some underlying scandal of vote rigging of some sort. Or another. And we cannot end up with this race being determined in the Supreme Court. Because you're sure that with Amy Coney Barrett on that court, they will decide no matter what for him. Yeah. I'm not so sure about that if there's some question. Like, I don't remember what happened in 2000 exactly and, and how the Supreme Court decided it. But I do. The only thing I do know is that it was very, very close. If it's a major gap, how does the Supreme Court? I just can't imagine the scenario where they make a case, a convincing case for Trump if if there's a a pretty big gap. The only way there's any question is if it's a close margin. What am I missing? Um, Right. If it's down, if 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 we're easily 10 states ahead and tons of 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 um, electors ahead, then, yeah, then they might determine one state. But what if um, they make some kind of a the a ruling about uh, the military at, at polling places and intimidation of voters, about um, uh, states where and districts where voters have been thrown out like crazy. Because the other, the other thing that's at, at stake here is the Senate, obviously. So I'm just I'm, I think it's good to be nervous. I think it's good to be scared. I think it's good to push friends and push people out there to say how important their vote really is. Agreed. And it's bad to be complacent. Absolutely. And the, uh, we saw that last time. Said, oh, I don't like Hillary that much. Oh, screw right. it. She's going to win anyway. We cannot afford that. And the 
Biden campaign manager came out and said it's not nearly, you know, she's trying trying to fight that kind of complacency or overconfidence mm-hmm. because, you know, you look at the, the, the polling, you, you talk to people, you listen to media pundits and experts, and you start to get a certain sense that the Joe Biden's running away with it. Shh, wash your mouth out. Now, you, 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 since you now have that lovely paneling by you, mm-hmm. you are required to knock wood when you say something like that. You've got to go knock wood. Is that really wood or is it Formica? I don't know. Uh, how dare you, first of all. That is uh, cedar tongue and groove, sir. Oh, you're in a closet. No, no moths are going to get you. Well, I was all excited. I was like, oh, it's going to be a cabin feel. And it is for me. But everybody that is uh, tuned into it the way you are right now said, what are you broadcasting from a sauna? You know, Screw you, people. <laughs> I did a lot of work here creating this. I once, I once did a TV interview from a sauna. Oh, please tell us about it. What was the so segment on? I did, I did a book about, about the value of publicness and privacy, and I made a point about Germans. Germans are crazy about privacy. They, they, they're, they're, they're the most, um, I would say, extreme in trying to deal with privacy laws. One mm. could argue why, but that's fine. So I, I pointed out what I call the German paradox, which is when you go to your first German sauna, it's naked and mixed. <gasps> and so the Germans care deeply about everything private except the privacy of their private parts. It was the joke. Uh, so this German TV station demanded the, to do the interview with me in the sauna. I was not naked. Uh, I was about to go searching through the logs to try to find video. <laughs> you that, don't want to see that. That is uh, an interesting story that brings us to another interesting subject uh, from election night to you're talking about privacy. I guess I'm forcing the segue here, but – I really wanted to talk with you and only you and others, but first you and mainly you about the Twitter censorship, the social media censorship that has occurred today, which I think is a very, very big deal. And we can talk about why. But and I, you know, I haven't really paid attention. I don't know exactly what happened. I'm trying to uh, look it up. But basically, Twitter said to Kaylee McEnany and I think a Trump organization or campaign Twitter handle or account. You cannot post this story. You're not allowed to post this story. We're censoring it. They have uh, been building up on censoring the president and others, kind of uh, getting their fake news off of Twitter and so on. What do you make of kind of the buildup before we get to today? And by buildup, I'm specifically thinking about Trump's tweets as of the, maybe the last six weeks, starting to be censored by Twitter? Well, first, I'm going to quibble with the verb. Oh, okay. uh, Censor uh, tends to be, and in fact, I have it right up here on my, on my Google. The Google tells me uh, a censor is an official who examines material, blah, 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 blah. It, censorship is an official act. Uh, to decide what you want to include in your uh, newspaper is not censorship. It's what you choose to do. Now, I don't think that Twitter is media, but Twitter has the right to decide what is on its platform or not. It's a private entity. Indeed, that is the essence of freedom of expression and the First Amendment. If it were otherwise, if they were forced to put something up there, then that would be you know, compelled speech, and that ain't free speech. So Twitter is, first and foremost, is exercising its First Amendment rights. And um, to do otherwise would be the censorship. Got it. And you have a tweet that you retweeted from uh, Mike Masnick that says, uh, in reference to Kayleigh McEnany, the press secretary's tweet about censoring political speech, uh, Mike writes, White ha- breaking White House press secretary doesn't believe in private property or the First Amendment. Twitter is free to host or not whatever it wants. Censorship is a function of the government. A company not wanting to associate with something is a core right. That's what you're saying. Yes, why exactly. I sh- I'm using the word censor. Ship in so, so now that I've been school marmish to correct you on that, now I'll get to finally to your real. That's why you come on the show. I mean, I, if, if someone I'm doesn't correct a jerk, you, and I, I, no, I'm jerk even not, to you, my friend. So not it's okay. at all a jerk. I mean, people hear that. That's why people want to listen to a show. Frankly, I'll just toot my own horn. Hosted by someone who who says and gets willing. things wrong all the time. Little words, well, phrases, willing, and facts. willing to be argued with. Well, I'm that's, not. That's I don't, great. Yeah. What the hell do I know? Yeah. Well. Nor me. Know how to put up cedar. With the two of us. Know how to put up tongue and groove cedar <laughs> as a piece falls while we're I think talking. It's a little uneven there in the corner. But oh, we'll damn it. Don't tell. So, um, right. So, so Twitter has an absolute right. Facebook has an absolute right to do this, number one. Number two, I wish they had set far more precedent in this long ago. 
Um, they should have said, to my mind, and I'll, I'll use Facebook instead. Facebook is Mark's garden party. Not a fun notion, I will admit. But you get invited to Mark's house for the garden party and you throw rumaki at somebody, you should be kicked out. And Twitter and Facebook should have some standards, right? But it doesn't because it says we believe in free speech. Okay, and I love that. I love that about this world. Yeah, I love the fact that Black Lives Matter never rose in um, white mainstream media. It never rose in, um, I'm going to read you a quote here in a second from a book I just got, um, in white media, and it is white media. So social media allowed this to rise. So the fact that we have more speech is a beautiful thing. I celebrate that speech. What I've been arguing, I think I've argued it to you in the show in the past, is that we don't have the mechanisms to listen. We don't have the mechanisms to find who's worth listening to and what is worth listening to, because all of it isn't worth listening to. It's fine if you want to speak, but I don't have to hear you. There's no, you have no right to make me hear you, to compel me to hear you. Um, right. So Twitter and Facebook in doing this are exercising their rights. Number one, they're exercising what I think should be modeling behavior. They should say that's unacceptable. We're not going to allow that here. We don't like, want that here. We have the right to say no. And they did that. So that's all to me, good news. The bad news of this is literally that our officials don't understand this, right? Not only the, the White House press secretary says, this is censorship, this is awful. Senator Hawley and Senator Cruz have both complained. Hawley complained out loud saying, we're going to come after you. Cruz sent a letter to Jack Dorsey saying, uh, you're going to answer the, for this fella, and I want you to answer all these questions. None of Cruz's damn business. The mere fact of that letter was an, an effort to use government to intimidate Speech. Ah, that's a that's really so important point that I didn't even think about. And certainly Ted Cruz didn't either. Do you think there are even any constitu- uh, conservative constitutional law scholars that would back up this idea that Twitter doesn't have the right to censor whatever it wants? And uh, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question because that censor. would be requiring me to violate my rules as a commentator and blatherer and give you an opinion about a court case that may still be on in a controversy. So, Senator, I've told you again and again <laughs> that I, I can't answer that and I'm not going to answer that. And you're going to have to guess what I think. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that was the best Amy Coney Barrett impression I've heard, <laughs> and you may be getting a knock on the oh, door. No, I can't. That voice. I'm sorry. I'm going to get. I'm, this is like body shaming. You shouldn't do voice shaming, but her voice does bug me. Really? Oh yeah, yeah. It now you me. have to correct for sexism. Who are the female voices who, that you enjoy hearing? Oh, virtually all of them except her. <laughs> Do you think it? Don't you think it's connected though, more to the words people are like? Have you ever really, oh, really is. loved? And you, you know, know so much about broadcasting. Someone's voice, and yet, I'll give you an example. Okay, I'll give you an example. Somebody who I I now uh, have a uh, uh, in media and professional terms I adore. I watch every day. Right? High pitch, Eric. Oh God, <laughs> <laughs> that's who you're so, going to tell me, right? Nicole Wallace. I think she's the greatest, right? Yeah. I think she's amazing. Uh-huh. When I first heard her, yeah, her, yeah, I might, I might say because she was Republican and all that. Maybe I was looking for something to be annoyed by. Maybe I wasn't sure about her voice. Now I think it's, I think it's wonderful. I think it's great. I think okay. she's brilliant. Um, so, so what's happening here is, though paradoxically, the reason we now can see full flesh the reason why the platforms don't want to do this is because when they do, they get boatloads of shit. Right. And, and this morning, Joe Scarborough starts out and, you know, I, I kind of hate watch the show. Um, I love your tweet today, that morning, so, Joe. You, you're very honest. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm very mad at NBC. I'm sure we'll talk about that in a second yeah, today. But, yeah, sure. but so morning Joe starts off. Morning Joe over the last couple of months has gone full moral panic and he shouts at the TV, Facebook, how do you leave this up? You must take this down, Facebook. You are awful, right? No, no, no. Right. So Twitter then takes down the linking to this New York Post travesty. And Joe said, oh, no, 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 no. You should leave that up because people are smart enough to figure that out. Well, they're also smart enough to figure out QAnon, Joe, and make up your damn mind. And and so I'm going to get fake academic on you for one second because I tweeted this today, too. I think that we are looking at media entirely wrong. Um, there's the in Lipman versus Dewey, two scholars from the early part of the last century. Uh, James Carey, a um, Columbia professor, the late James Carey, 
summarizes their views and says that there's a transmission view of media, which is Lipton's, which is it's there to give you facts. And that's what we live under today. The other view is a ritual view. And the ritual view is, says, no, we don't really get facts. We get a mirror to ourselves. It may be a cracked mirror. It may be a messed up mirror. But it's, it's a ritual. It's like going to mass. Hmm. You don't go to mass to learn anything. You go to mass to, to repeat the liturgy. Um, and, and, and so there's this, 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 if you want to talk about echo chambers, that's, that's what the media are. So the whole idea that if we just got rid of these fake news, we got rid of these lies, and we got rid of this stupid stuff, everything would be okay. No, underneath that is a ritual view. All of this is performative. The people who believe in QAnon don't really believe in QAnon. They believe in making you believe they believe in QAnon because it's going to piss you off. Right? It's performance. And underneath that is a, an epistemological war that says, I don't care what the facts are. I don't like you. And, and if you say that and the elite say that and your damned experts say that, I'm just going to do the opposite. Right. Even if it means I'm going to kill my family by not wearing masks, I own you. That's where we are right now. So we have a media system that's not set up to figure that out in old media, though it was set up better because you had bookers and editors and, and you couldn't get on the media now. right? So now when, when we're going to hear all these voices, we don't know what to do with it. And all we're hearing is society as it really is. And now we need different systems to help make it work. And we don't have them yet. And it's going to take a few generations to get there. A few generations? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You think there'll be a planet left to fix that problem? Uh, maybe. It took a... So I, I'm I mean, there'll on, be a planet. It just might not be that many humans. I'm, I'm trying to work on a book on the Gutenberg age, which I haven't even taken it to an editor yet because I've got to make sure I can write the damn thing. I'm well into it. And I just wrote a piece, wrote a section of it, where I realized that... After Gutenberg, pardon me, walkout moment, it was 150 years. It was from 1450 till around 1600 before we had the invention of the modern novel with Cervantes, the invention of essays with Montaigne, the, 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 the development of a market for printed plays with Shakespeare, the invention of the newspaper. So it took that long for people to, to stop looking at a book and seeing technology and to start looking at a book and seeing humanity. A Gutenberg moment is one which changes the way we produce and consume text as dramatically as Gutenberg's machine did. Yes, but I think it's even more than that. It's not about text. That's our, that's our Gutenberg-centric way to look at it. What it is instead is conversation. Society is relearning how to have a conversation with itself. And that's what we're screwing up because we don't know how to do it. We haven't done it for 550 years. I am during Sober October and not drinking, but I made a little secret to myself, promised myself, if anybody said Gutenberg moment to me this whole month, I would be free and clear to have a drink again. So Bring thank you. Thank you for rubbing that <laughs> lamp and liberating me. On, on, on my other podcast this week in Google, <laughs> there is a drinking game that anytime I'd mention Gutenberg, you can have a, a, a slug. Is that right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was actually onto a real thing. Yeah, you are. <laughs> so, Okay. Let's I mean, just to be clear, though, staying on this issue of of what Twitter did, this is about I don't know how much you know about this story. I am going to probably talk to somebody else about this to get the real nitty gritty into it. But this is this is about this thing that we've been hearing for a long time that Joe Biden pushed out a Ukrainian prosecutor who was investigating his son. And that's not a thing that happened, but it's a perfect narrative or, or or situation for people to believe that happened. It's very believable that someone in power for reasons of nepotism or corruption would promote uh, somebody or get rid of somebody that is a threat to them or so on. And Hunter Biden was working for this company in consulting and was obviously uh, trading on his father's name, as I would argue every person with a last name does. Pretty much everybody but Nicolas Cage. And I, I just think that people just didn't turn the page and to what the accusation was. The truth is, of course, uh, that the entire world community, uh, in international institutions, wanted this prosecutor gone. It had nothing to do with Hunter yes, Biden which or has been Burisma. Said again and again and again and again. So this New York um, Post story is false. And it's problematic for uh, several reasons. And Twitter said, we're not going to be allowing you to share this New York Post story. Uh, do I have the, it right? Yes, here? it's also, well, they had to find, the thing about Silicon Valley is, even though they have a First Amendment right and, and a private right to do whatever the hell they want just because they want to do it, and they can say, I don't like guys with beards, you guys are off, you're gone. 
unless you shave. They can do that, right? That's for that's, that's the right. But they have to instead know they've got to find a scalable policy that can be enforced uh, evenly. Um, so that's what they always try to do. So this, this went afoul of their distribution of hacked material policy, reading from the Twitter, Twitter feed. Twitter safety for Twitter feed. Um, and, and the material uh, was, of course, from a computer that somehow got in the hands of Rudy Giuliani. And that's all you need to know that where it's messed up. If is Rudy that the Giuliani computer that he accidentally one. taped himself and then uploaded it onto YouTube of him doing a racist impression of Asian people? Did you <laughs> no, that see that? Computer. That's another computer. That's so weird. Uh, uh, you know, uploading a video to YouTube is kind of hard. It's like five steps. How did he do that? When, 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 when he was running for president the first time, mm-hmm. Rudy, Rudy's Twitter feed was private. What? Uh, yeah, it was. He, that's, how, that's how stupid they were. He didn't, they, they, they didn't know. Twitter they didn't know private. they had it on pr- set for private. They were no, tweeting. I think they, no, they, just, they thought that was the right thing to do. Um, <laughs> then don't have it, idiot. <laughs> Why anyway, have a Twitter account? So, it, so it, it violated their hack materials policy. Now, and the safety team um, got rid of it. Now, I think Jack is, 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 is rolling back a little bit about the communications of Jack this. Jack Dorsey of Twitter, yeah. Thank you. But, or otherwise known as at Jack. Um, but uh, I think they did the right thing. And, and I think that it was the brave thing to do. And they're going to they're gonna just get buckets and buckets and barrel loads of shit for it. But it's time that we start to speak up about this asymmetrical bad behavior. But by the way, I mean, the thing that irks the shit out of me about this story is, you know, the, the, the situational ethics and the hypocrisy of the idea that, hey, listen, if you're the vice president of the United States, your your family members should not be having certain jobs. They should, shouldn't have them. There should be laws against it. They shouldn't be trading on your name and making deals, you know, introducing, uh, you know, developing introductions, having Joe Biden introduce his son, all these things that he'd be being accused of doing. But Donald Trump is doing this stuff every single day. His yeah. kids are making deals all the time. He's completely invested, not divested in companies and interests all over the world while being the president of the United States. If you actually cared about the thing that you're saying you're outraged, you're insinuating that Hunter and Joe Biden are involved in, which they aren't. But if, if you really cared about that, you would be outraged by the well, daily activity of the nepotistic, is that a word, behavior of the Trump family. Mm-hmm. It is. And, but... Um, we shift from but her email to but his son. Right. Right. Yeah. And so every time in, 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 in the screwed up journalism that we have, our failing journalism, uh, uh, the feeling of balance, every time they mentioned the Trump scandal, they had to mention something equal on Hillary, and it was always her email. And so they're trying to play on that. And it worked, right? The New York Times reported on the New York Post piece, and the Washington Post did. The Washington Post had a good explainer about it. But it doesn't matter because it puts it into the public conversation. Mm. Yeah, I saw something about Biden and his son again. Yeah, I don't know. It smells funny to me, people say. You know, I didn't read it. I just, I, yeah, I just wondered about that. You don't think the Times or the Post need. should have gone with either of those stories? I actually think no. Hmm. I think that, that so there's, there's a view in my wonky journal world um, that we should be uh, serving what some call truth sandwiches. It's I've a had little, one. A little wonky. But but the the argument is that that if you if you come out denying if you say the New York Post reported lies about uh, Hunter Biden, that won't register in people's heads. What will register is oh Hunter Biden's in the news and it's something about right. a scandal. Right, right, right. right? Yep. So yep. that if you are going to say anything, you start off saying what you did. There is no truth to this. There's da 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 da. This is not what. But the New York Post said this, and then you repeat in a sandwich. Yet there's no truth to this, and so your 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 pitch becomes. Um, uh, to give truth. Now, that's that's weird in our field because we don't usually just say, oh, this is the truth and there's no reason to tell you this except somebody lied. Um, i just getting a tweet, by the way. Now I'm doing exactly what you just said not to do, but I got to indulge. Uh, somebody saying, uh, Hunter Biden, you know, trying to combat me and argue me on Twitter. I said this whole thing was such a false narrative. He says, not a false narrative. Hunter Biden sat on a company board and abused his father's status. Um, uh, again, I like to sometimes concede to an argument and be like, even if that were true, so what? So what? What does that have to um, do with w- Joe uh, Biden? Jimmy Carter is the most upright president we probably ever had. Not the best president, but put that aside. Uh, and his brother, um, was a mess. Uh, Hillary had a troubled brother. 
Uh, there are family members of these presidents who, uh, I mean, haven't you, haven't you ever seen the movie about the priest and the mobster? Uh, you're not responsible for your family members' activities, even your children's activities. Right. And so it's just I, I'm not sure why that's even an argument. OK, so you basically just to wrap up this part of our conversation about Twitter and the, their rules, you think it's uh, – is it simple? I don't want to simplify, but is it simple no. that Twitter did the right thing here? Is it a, was it a very tough call for them? And more, most importantly, my concern at just hearing about this, Jeff, was that it would be an accelerant, and we don't need any accelerant on the right wing echo chamber, um, and play right into their narrative about that Twitter and, and even Google and, and Facebook, which is the the least uh, uh, evidence of, are somehow censoring conservative thought and promoting liberal thought, which is completely untrue. Then then you've lost because then they are compelling you to keep up the things that you don't want. And this is where we're stuck right now, because Section 230, which is basically the First Amendment of the Internet that 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 keeps companies from having liability for either putting the stuff up that others did or for taking it down, is being challenged. It's being challenged all around, and it's especially being challenged by, I mean, the left is challenging it too, and I'm mad at them for that, but the right is particularly. Because basically when you have people screaming, take down this fascist stuff, and then you do, the right wing says, hey, that was my fascist stuff. <laughs> don't take that down. Right. And that's where we are. So if we follow your rule of don't rile them, that's what they manipulate. They're manipulating the weaknesses in a democracy based on freedom of expression, free information. And so they feed us fake news. They feed us this kind of rage. And if we sit back and, and, and say, well, I don't want to rile them, so I'm going to leave it up there, then they've won. Well, I feel like you misconstrued my position and made it personal that I don't think they should be riled. I think they should be. I think this ah. is the right decision. I'm simply pointing out to you that they're going to be riled. Yeah. They're going oh, to yeah. be, you know, they're going it's to be a gift to them either way. It's like it's like don't don't not Pete, don't not do that because people are going to be mad. Sure. I've made choices for that reason a lot. But uh, no, no, do this. It's, they're going to be mad. Uh, they're going to be outraged. Ted Cruz is going to write a letter and uh, subpoena the head of Twitter. Good luck with all of that. That's what has to be done. I, I think that this is a long time coming. And I think that because uh, it's very dangerous what people are posting and people with huge followings and how fast their lies and threats travel. I mean, the president of the United States posted this week a crazy conspiracy theory that, that Osama bin Laden was not killed and there was a body double, which it took this asshole who killed bin Laden to who basically sounds has sounded supportive, this Navy SEAL of Trump uh, got real mad at him. He's like, you're saying I didn't kill bin Laden. You've lost me, dude. Actually, I don't know if you've lost him. <laughs> but I mean, the guy who killed bin Laden, who's a supporter of Trump, it's like, whoa. I mean, the point I'm making is you got to no, you can't. The president of the United States has 80 million Twitter followers. He can't put out that there was a body double of bin Laden. You got to take that down. You got to take it down. Yeah, I, I, I think so. But neither can you be required to take down everything that's wrong. That's what, what Facebook argues is you don't want us to be the arbiter of truth. Uh, true. We don't want them to say what's true and what's not. Um, and it's just it doesn't scale. It's difficult. But when it's the president of the United States. Yeah, I think it's a pretty clear cut case. So I think it's what happened in Twitter's case. I think they've been waiting for the moment when there was something that violated a rule they had in place. What did you think then along these lines of Kamala Harris's question of Amy Coney Barrett this week when she asked her how she felt or where she stood on the science of tobacco causing cancer? And what was the first one she mentioned? Uh, I played it on the podcast, too. I, I think it was time. racism and cancer or something like that. No, it was um, COVID. No, it, it was, was no, it was COVID, a virus spread. COVID. Oh, yeah, it's COVID. It's COVID dangerous. Which you it's had, COVID like, dangerous. Yes. Yeah. Can you catch it or something like that? Yeah, uh, right. It's tobacco, you know, deadly. What about climate change? And then the first two, she said, yes, those are, yeah, those are, I believe, I agree with those non-controversial statements that are based on science. And what about climate change? Oh, I can't. That I can't uh, wait. Got, Kamala got her exactly where she wanted her. Because oh, Okay, so then you are saying that climate change is debatable. Yeah. Silence. So, yes, she is. Uh, so, given that, we've now got to move on to 
NBC News and their decision Ugh. this week Ugh. to air Donald Trump opposite Joe Biden. Now, of course, there should be a debate. We're talking on the day it should be tonight. There was scheduled a debate because of the, co- uh, the, the president catching the virus he said didn't exist. He then they wanted to make it virtual. Biden said, yes. Trump said, I won't do virtual because it'll it's may, way harder for me to be a, an asshole. And you might cut my mic, et cetera. And I want everybody to be able to see my legs. And then Biden's like, OK, well, I, I don't tell you. I don't know who approached if Biden, ABC approached Biden or Biden approached them. But Biden campaign. But they're holding a town hall a on ABC News. All right. Joe Biden's still going to be on TV tonight. Then yesterday, NBC announces, yeah, we're going to do a town hall with Trump at the same exact time. What was your reaction to that when you first heard it? Anger. Uh, a lot of loud anger. I sounded like Joe Scarborough yelling. Um, you know, I, I came downstairs. My wife, the first thing she said to me this morning as I was getting breakfast is ABC should move it. ABC should move theirs. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, hmm, that's NBC did that. a terrible thing here. They gave Trump what he wanted. They he let it. This is this is trolling. He won. He won. He didn't have to do the debate. He gets to go against Joe Biden uh, with with. Um, three networks instead of one. Uh, and then he didn't have to do, uh, you know, COVID tests. He didn't have to do anything. Well, he did do a COVID test. I'll take it back. But somebody we both know, and I won't say who it is. We shouldn't speculate who it is. But somebody we both know who works there said to me once, Jeff, it's a conservative. It's a Republican company. Mm. Right, it's Comcast and NBC. It's a it's a Republican company, and and I'm not saying that they're trying to make Trump win, but I am saying that uh, their hearts aren't in the right places. Well, I I don't yeah I know who I think you're, who you're talking about, and I remember not agreeing with that because I had this is really actually brought up some emotion in me over I, I've been thinking this has been a year since SiriusXM ended my contract this week and. Ooh. I've spent too much time every day thinking about why, because I was really well liked there and was doing a great job. Like, why? And, I mean, the why was we're ending the channel that you created, Pete, and never actually uh, tried to implement. They never tried to implement it. And we don't have a place for you. We don't have to, you know, I think a lot of it was my salary. They didn't want to pay people. They wanted to do these ad revenue sharing deals where they didn't have to pay people much. And... um but I think part of it was because I had become problematic because of the Steve Bannon thing. So the argument they made was basically not one of political ideology. So when we say MSNBC is a, a Republican company, I, I don't really buy that. I think that they're just executives without ethics who only, only care about one measurement, which is ratings. That's it. And that's what the Sirius XM executives told me. It's not my job to put in my ideology because I, as I've said this publicly many times, I tried to plead to the Jewish executives that hiring Steve Bannon was he was an anti-Semite. They argued with me that he wasn't, but more importantly said, even if I agreed with you, that's not something I can factor into my decision. We have conservative, we have liberal, we have middle, we have it all here. We're an entertainment company. This is what we do. I think the same could be said for NBC. We're, you know. Our job is to get ratings. It's not about their political ideology. Same thing with all of the major corporate media networks. Ratings. How do you get them? Doesn't matter as long as you get them. Yeah. um, Right. So when I say it's a Republican company, that also means it's a greedy company. And so, right, the fact that they made Trump into a star. It's NBC's fault that we have Trump. Because of the apprentice. Trump would have been, not only that he wouldn't have been famous, he would have been broke. As the New York Times has made right. clear, he kept his nose above the water only because of the revenue from NBC. Right. So NBC made him a celebrity with all the worst that entails. NBC hid the true nature of the man because that's what entertainment does. Um, NBC gave him money that kept him afloat. And NBC hid whatever tapes there are out there that would show his worst behavior. Not that that would necessarily have made a difference if he said the N-word, but maybe at the time it would have. So NBC bears tremendous responsibility for bringing us Donald Trump. And so now by doing this, yeah, it's ratings, it's attention. It's, ah, take that ABC. Um, aren't we clever? Uh, I don't know if you heard last night as, as they did the switch over from Chris to Rachel, 
there was a uh, Chris Hayes just said uh, the show won't be on tomorrow night at this time. And Rachel said that was a very pregnant pause. And Chris said, yes, that's as far as they got to protest. But here's the thing. And well, then later on, Rachel Maddow had Kamala Harris on and asked her about it. And Kamala was like, I don't want to touch that. And I was like, why do you want to touch that? Number one. And why is Rachel Maddow being so I I'm actually it was very super disappointed in all of them. I tweeted yesterday. What are Chris? What are the progressive voices in, in, in primetime going to say about their company's decision? I said things about my company's decision when I worked there on MSNBC and on our air. I no longer work there. Maybe that's why. But integrity matters. And they are way more important to their companies than I was to my company. What's what's the worst that could happen? The NBC Entertainment side, a lot of people have spoken out, apparently. But in the in the kind of the NBC News world, they're being coy. I have lost a lot of respect for them for not saying yep. why. And, and for an NBC News should engender. And I, I leave it to you, sir. Uh, journalism professor, what should a media company engender in its columnists? Should part of it, I mean, don't they usually often have uh, credible ones, an ombudsman? Should they? Should you not be allowed to talk, criticize your own company, Absolutely whether you make should. paper towels or news? Absolutely, you should. I, I, I was on a session, 87th Zoom call, I can't remember what it was, but with a uh, uh, an editor from a, col- a paper in Columbia. So somebody who's used to dealing with danger. Wow, you're bragging. And uh, a columnist of hers had criticized this editor. And she said that her board got mad at her. You know, you should get rid of her. She's criticizing you. And she said, no, that's part of what this is about yes. is, I, is I do that. You should value that. I wanted to hear what Rachel Maddow really thought about yes. this. And I didn't hear it. There was a, some, I wish I had it in front of me. I don't have it. But there was a transgender um, actor who's on, I think, a peacock show or something and nbc who said nbc is paying my paycheck but i have to say that i'm against this and i tweeted back saying i hope we see similar courage from nbc news employees and we haven't um and it's fine for everybody to say i'm gonna boycott nbc it's not gonna do a damn bit of good nobody's not gonna matter we can just we can vent our anger but it was a it was a really cruddy thing to do and and it's and it it almost amounts to an October surprise. It's, I, I, I wish I could disagree with you on that. I really do. And I, I don't know what, what is going to happen. This will air after they, they – but it sounds like what you're saying, and I think I agree with this. Nothing, n- nothing you can do. Last night, uh, one of my subscribers in our Hangout was like, everybody call NBC. I'm like, I don't, I don't think there's, there's anything anybody can do to stop it. I think it goes on and maybe, you know, people have been very critical of Savannah Guthrie, who will be the moderator. Again, this is airing after everybody's seen it. So who knows what happens? But, you know, what would you say before it airs, Jeff, about what could be done or more importantly, what is the long term, if any, damage that this does to the credibility of NBC News, which has lost so much credibility to begin with? What with the Matt Lauer scandal and, and many other things? And yeah, the I think they were starting to come back. I think that MSNBC has been an important force yeah. in, in these three years. Yeah. Uh, and this, this, this has to hurt the people who are good there. Um, you know, it's, it's one night, it's one hour. Uh, it'll be over. We'll, uh, we'll watch the video clips. So the, one of the people I follow on Twitter who, who clips all these kinds of things said, well, I can't actually do that one because NBC is really an asshole about, about using clips in Twitter. So they, you know, add more asshole points now. Um, we'll read tomorrow what was said. I'm going to watch Joe Biden. Uh, but Joe's going to be, by comparison, boring. Yes. That's the point. Yes. And um, so I just got some news here while we're speaking. Okay. I just saw some news. Um, Ajit Pai, the chairman of the FCC, is going to make rules about Section 230, which I mentioned earlier. Section 230, just to explain to your listeners one more time, is a piece of law that says that online companies are not responsible for what their users do. They have a safe harbor there. And they also have the full right to take down what their users do without hurting, uh, uh, making any precedent there. It's up to them. And it's really important to enable the conversation. Without it, companies would say, if I'm liable for what Pete says on my podcast network, 
no Pete podcast, man. I'm getting rid of all the podcasts because I don't know what he and his stupid guests like Jarvis are going to say. And I'm liable to hell with this. Forget it. We're going to put on 80s rock and we're done. And so um, that's what 230 allows. Right. But now the conservatives, the far right is going after 230 because they say, well, it allows Twitter to censor us, even though Twitter is not censoring the government censors. And even though they there is a First Amendment right. So Ajit Pai says in here that uh, social media companies have a First Amendment right to free speech, but they do not have a First Amendment right to special immunity denied to other media outlets, such as newspapers and broadcasters. One, that's completely wrong and screwed up. But two, this is a shot across the bow. We had Clarence Thomas allegedly on the Supreme Court this week also trying to push for Section 230 to be taken against the platforms as a way to force right-wing speech onto them. That's where we are right now, is we have our own Pravda in the making, that these, we might as well live in Colombia, where, or, or in Venezuela now, uh, where uh, the government forces speech. That's what's happening. This is scary shit. Ajipai is get the- backed up by the Supreme Court. It's got to go through, and they're going to try to do it, but then the courts are all packed. Truly packed by the right wing. Sorry, I had to do my wonky moment there. No, it's good. But uh, Ajapai, uh, did you say he's the, the current chairman of the FCC? Yes, he is. And uh, Senator Rod w- Ron Wyden tweets, the FCC does not have the authority to rewrite the law, and Ajit Pai can't appoint himself commissioner of the speech police. But he's going to try to. And so what's going to happen is he's going to do this, and then they're going to – uh, find some, you know, they're going to go after Facebook or go after Twitter. Uh, a, they could just chill them. Jack says, oh, let's, let's, not, let's not do this right now. Uh, or B, uh, Jack still does it, and then they take him on, and then it's going to go into the courts. But who's in the courts, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. The right wing. Um, okay, so, yeah, that's the, uh, the big... And nobody likes technology these days because we're in a full-fledged moral panic. So the Democrats aren't very good at this. Joe Biden's talked about repealing Section 230. He's not much better. But people are trying to get to him to say, Ixnay, Joe. No, you're wrong. Uh, follow Jarvis for more on that because he's uh, often tweeting about it and writing about it on your blog as well. It's really very important, and people don't uh, always necessarily realize it. Cause, it's boring! Well, yeah, yeah, but it's important. But you make all the boring things sexy. So let me ask you, speaking of sexy, uh, death is a sexy subject. Um, you follow really closely the experts uh, talking about, tweeting about COVID. You've uh, uh, created this awesome list of the the best experts that people can find. Bitly slash COVID Twitter list. Bitly slash COVID Twitter list, which I'll link to in the show notes for today's episode. And Jeff, what I'm seeing, though, just in the news is that uh, COVID is making a strong comeback right now. It's spiking not only here, but in some of the European countries who seemingly had clamped down on it, including now uh, Germany. And uh, I just want to know what your overall thoughts are about uh, the trends as it's happening as we head into autumn here in the U.S. into a presidential election, which I have said a thousand times. I'd swim through a river of COVID to get to my polling place and vote for anybody, including someone uh, named COVID as COVID, if need be. So I, I'm not sure how much it affects the vote. I think it's awesome that we have this young poll worker movement so that all the people that are working in the polls aren't older, vulnerable folks. Uh, led by like people like LeBron James and other celebrities. I think that's great. But where are we right now, COVID-19 in the U.S. and um, as a global community? Screwed. We are screwed. Uh, I think that it's, uh, it's going to get worse. I saw a really good data visualization yesterday on Twitter mm-hmm. uh, of red states versus blue states on on COVID. And of course, at the beginning, it was blue states. And then you can see clearly the blue states all move to the bottom and the red states all move up. I saw another good visualization from someone at the New York Times that just had showed the spikes over time. And yes, it started in New York and, and Northern California slash Seattle, but then it all moved down into red states. And that's where we are. Uh, we have governments that don't believe in government and they're not going to use their power and authority and uh, abilities to save us. And so we're on our own, all of us out here. And the problem is, it's not just, you know, it's, it's, I can try my best to be good, but it all it takes is one moment. All it takes is one clump of viruses and, and we're vulnerable. And, and the fact that there's no sanctity for human life, this is, this is the, you know, of all the pro- paradoxes we have, of yeah, all yeah. the paradoxes we have yeah. is the pro-life paradox of I'm for the fetus, but 
I don't really care if 220,000 Americans are dead and I'm going to help kill them. Uh, I, I, I'm going to let people get killed by guns. I'm going to let people get killed by police. I'm not going to kill people with uh, the, the death penalty. Uh, but I'm pro-life. Um, that's the cruelest joke that we have today. So I, I just think that the scientists are appalled. They've been appalled. They've been saying the same things all along. Once we figured out the, the value of masks, and it did take a little while, but that's science, folks. Um, we know that. And the fact that we in media cannot convince people to wear this flimsy little bit of fabric just to try to save lives means that that's where journalism and media fail us utterly. It ain't working. It needs to be completely rethought because it's not working. I think that firemen that use water to put out fires are losers. Oh, I, yeah. also, I also think that scuba divers should go without masks if they really want to man up. I think that the catcher on baseball shouldn't shouldn't wear a cup to protect his nuts. I think he's a pussy. <laughs> oh, that's macho. That's getting macho. Yeah, now. yeah. I mean, it really it's such a fascinating thing, you know, that that's what that's what we're looking at. And people do it against their own demonstrable it's so self interest. Crazy and, right? and and hurting. Yeah, it's one thing to be so quote toxically masculine that you're not going to wear a mask. But usually when our masculinity, not always, but usually our crazy toxic masculinity doesn't necessarily hurt those people around us. I mean, we might not have a lot of friends, but I mean, your, your, your stupid ego and macho bullshit is killing the people that you even care about most. And it's just – but I think the more important point to drive the conversation along is that we are such a zero-sum society – it's all or nothing. And I think what media and scientists need to say, and they do, but not as clearly and as repetitively as they should, is this is not going to end anytime soon. We must adapt to it. We must work together. And hopefully we will get a vaccine that will greatly decrease the, the illness, the contraction and, 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 and the killing. But it's going to be there. It, we're not we're going to for a few years. eradicate I, 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 it. There's no way that this changes for less than one year. That's, that's the absolute best case. We are in full lockdown or stupidity, if you're not in lockdown, for at least a year, I think. And we've only gone through, how many months has it been? Since March. April, May, June, July, August, September. Know, so six, six, six and a half months. Yeah, so double this uh, minimum, minimum. Sometime in 2022, we might start to see some improvement. But if you're an old fart like me with pre-existing conditions, I'm, I'm well, again, all it takes is one idiot who wouldn't get a vaccine and won't wear a mask near me, and I'm still screwed. The hardest thing, and you'll probably have no sympathy for this, and I don't expect you to, but for people especially like us who have kids in their adolescent years telling them you know to be careful when they hang around with their friends or limit how many friends they hang around with but there's there's nothing there's so, there's very little that you can do no there's um isn't. to stop them from hanging out with their friends if anything i've if any battle i've won it's that they're not going inside other people's homes and their friends aren't coming in my daughter hangs out with a bunch of boys and uh my 13 year old and they were all in the house and i walked in i was like what are you doing what are you doing in my house get outside and you know my, my, neck out there, why don't you? Yeah, neck, <laughs> neck out there. But I, I mean, I, I just think that people don't understand what what we need to do. They don't take it seriously enough. They don't want to do it, and there just hasn't been enough leadership on it. Obviously, but and like you said, it's going to be at least another year of this adapting. So I was, I was thinking about it this morning, Pete. Uh, so it was kismet that you called because I'm curious what you think about this. Is that is that I've been I've been saying okay if we if we get rid of Trump then we got a few horrible months of him still being there able to do horrible things and then January 20 if God smiles upon the world and um, a certain justice is up there now with her um, and we get Biden and I'm thinking okay it's gonna get better then then we can get all these things then I thought well we're still gonna have the same idiots. Um, a, a national mask mandate? Well, that'll lead to a civil war. He won't be able to do it. He'll have, you know, all these states will say, no effing way, Joe, I'm not doing your bidding. Screw your masks. Yeah, we can get more tests. We can get more masks for doctors to wear. Um, yeah, we can, we can help people with their unemployment. But I just got this horrible thought this morning that even with a smart president, even with a, a, a moral legislature, I'll, I'll go that far, hmm. um, I don't know. We're so far down this pike. I don't know that there's much we can do. 
Well, the one the thing that scares me the most, nobody has seemingly a good answer for, is like even if the federal government under Joe Biden and a Democratic uh, House and Senate was able to pass some kind of legislation or policy uh, that said, listen, if you if your state wants federal funding, we were we are happy to do what we're supposed to do uh, and incentivize. But you, we, you have to incentivize. You have to mandate that people wear a mask, which is the federal government should be able to absolutely enforce public guess health what's gonna happen. policy. Guess what's going to happen? Lawsuits. And where do those lawsuits go? Right, right. Uh, to the Supreme Court, which is dominated by uh, handmaid's uh, tail uh, yes. members, uh, Commissioner of Gilead. But the other thing is the vaccine. That's what really haunts me. Like, let's say there were an effective vaccine, which is not a guarantee. The next question is, how oh. do we convince people to take it? The best answer I get is, well, you're not going to be able to send your kids to, to, to our school without it. And I think that will be effective. And I think that will work for a certain percentage of the population, but that does not everybody goes to school. Not everybody. And we're, and we're also stuck with that. Well, yeah, there'll be a lot of homeschooling going on, which is exactly where we are today with other vaccines. That's why some diseases should be gone, aren't gone. There was a very good story in the New York Times yesterday about um, a woman in Europe who is whose job it is to fight down anti-vaccination rumors. And it was it was right along the lines of the social journalism we teach. And it says that the first thing to do is not just to scream, you're wrong and stupid, right? The first thing to do is to listen and to try to build trust. And it's maddening, yes. Uh, And it doesn't mean you have to agree with the conspiracy theories and the anti-science and all of that. But you got to make people feel as if they're heard, which goes back to what we started with, with kind of media, is that is that media are not good at that, right? We speak, we don't listen. You listen, but you're not all a media. And I should be. I know you should be, but but no, you actually don't want to be. I want an empire. No, I certainly don't. If I I mean, go ahead. Sorry. If I wanted to be, I would simplify everything and scream all the time and perform. So I I, I just got a book just arrived yesterday that I've been wanting to get uh, called Distributed Blackness, African-American Cybercultures by Andre Brock Jr. Uh, Hmm. It went up. It's up free online at NYU. And I read a couple pages. I said, oh, I want this. So if I may do a, a reading of a, of a oh, brief paragraph. Oh, yes, please do. Um, so this is about the internet and, and, and black culture there. Despite protestations about color blindness or neutrality, the internet should be understood as an enactment of whiteness through the interpretive flexibility of whiteness as information. By this, I mean that white folks' communications, letters, and works of art are rarely understood as white. Instead, they become universal and are understood as mm. communication, literature, and art. Mm. This slippage allows for a near infinite variety of signifiers for linguistic and aesthetic concepts absent the specific racial modifier centering them in white American culture. (laughs) From this perspective, Western technoculture has an inordinate role in shaping the Internet experience in many online environments. Right. So I think it was really, really smart. And and what it says to me is that if you're in a whole bunch of communities, if you're African-American in this country, you know, I keep on talking about how the Internet, I said it on the show already, how the Internet gave us the ability to finally hear Black Lives Matter and Living While Black and Me Too. Part of what this book is already saying, I'm only a few pages into it, but it's saying is that um, we don't necessarily want to be heard by you. That's trying to make you the standard again. That makes you, the, you white man, the standard of what's worthwhile. No, we're going to have our own culture, thank you very much. And we're going to be here, and we finally can. And we can be banal. We can, we can have fun together. We can celebrate ourselves. We can be glad we got through a day. And we can have our own culture uh, because we couldn't in your world. Right. Right. So that. And you stole hand, everything that we made that was good and then said it. You 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 owned it. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I was raised in this country in a time of the belief in, in the melting pot and color blindness. And I didn't realize the essential racism in that, that it was everything will be OK when you're all like us. The majority. Right. right. Uh, so now what's happening is I have an op ed I wrote that I can't place. Washington Post won't take it. I get the only times to take it. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll put it up as a blog post. But I've talked about this before the show. It's about the last stand of the old white man. Mm-hmm. I being one. And, and and what this is kind of uh, where we head here and where the old white men are going to lose power, lose majority. They know it. They're burning the fields behind them. But behind them are cultures. And, and, and among them are African-Americans, and, 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 and we call them Latinx, but that's actually 20 different cultures. And, yes, a culture of fascists, too. They're there, too. But in a polyglot society, you can have some tolerance when you realize, yeah, there's some fascists over there, but <sighs> ignore them. 
And we can be better off when we start to value the other parts of our culture. But we're not there yet now because we still think we're fighting for this view of the mass. It's and, very important what you're saying. And, and, and I'm just working this out, trying to understand it myself and trying, trying to read it and, and, and write about it. But I think that that's, that's where we are right now. And um, we're fearing that we're being taken over by these people and we've let them take over. Or, that's what's happening tonight on NBC. Uh, well, I also think uh, the, 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 there's a huge fear amongst white people, especially that if we allow people of color or minorities to have their own their culture and be autonomous, that it takes something from us, that it hurts us. Or even in my case, sometimes I, I worry that it segregates us further uh, and that you don't want to have anything to do with me. And that's just my own insecurity, of course, and my own lack of ability to kind of wrap my head around what you're saying about being able to own your own space, your own culture and, and be who you are, how you are, wherever you are, and including in the workplace where you still have to mix. You know, I hear this from a lot of black women, especially that they have to change their hair when they go to work. And it's pretty openly said. And that's why you see a lot of people, I think Zerlina Maxwell's really good at this, like just almost like just constantly screwing with her hair. Tiffany Cross just constantly coming with different hairstyles and going not into the corporate workplace selling widgets, but on TV showing you, here is my diversity, here is my hair, here is my whatever it is, and deal with it. And the reaction for the majority should be, great, wish I had yeah. hair. Yeah. Oh, speaking of which, you brought case. her up. Uh, who are you rooting for for Joy's old slot? Tiffany Cross. Same here. Same here. Uh, yeah. What is going to happen? I don't know. I'm afraid to ask all of them. All of Some of them I know better than others, right. but I'm afraid to ask them, what are you guys doing? Is, what are you being told? This happened at SiriusXM where they kept a time slot open and they used rotating guests and they made promises, the same promise. They played games with people's heads. Yeah, and I think it's bad for everybody, including it and especially the viewers. I, 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 Zerlina was apparently in the running, but she now has her Peacock show, which right, is great. Right. I'm, I'm very happy for her. I think yeah. she's wonderful. Uh, so yeah, I want Tiffany and that. She's been brilliant in that yeah, show. I think, she's, I think she's great. I think she's entertaining. I think she's uh, brilliant. And um, yeah, I don't know. I think, but here's the thing that I will say. I think executives should make decisions based not wholly on who is the best person for the job, who gets the best ratings, who's the most effective. But I think that they should ask the staff who probably is um, static. The staff works with all uh, whoever hosts that time slot. We're talking about Saturday and Sunday morning on MSNBC. Who do they like to work with the most? Who treats them the best? Who comes in with the most ideas? Who's the hardest yeah. worker as opposed to who the audience likes? Because there's often a disconnect with the person on the air and the people that are making that show work. And I know that you know a lot of people that that's the case about. Mm -hmm. So you might be amazing on the air and very effective at getting ratings. Oh, wait, Pete. Off the microphone is every bit as nice as Pete on the microphone. Well, you've seen, though, but so you, you know. say that you're being generous, Pete, but you've seen how I treat my people here. Yes. All, all your huge staff. <laughs> I, I want to know. Let me, get, I let me just get let me get her because don't act like I don't have a staff. You tell Jeff how I treat you. <laughs> oh. This is my main staff member right here. It's my dog. He's a good girl. My dog, Who's Indy. A good girl. He's abusive. Um, so uh, I, I know it's a prop, but to show that he you know, does his own work and that he cares about his own stuff, he doesn't make other people do his work, Pete has a show vacuum in the he show. <laughs> yeah, my wife is like, where's the vacuum cleaner? Um, um, I'm sorry, honey, it's I'll get prop, it. It's a prop, honey. I'm trying to look like I'm uh, you know, all, all woke and clean. Uh, that's and awesome. Neat. Yeah, that damn vacuum cleaner. Battery keeps running out. All right. Um, let's wrap it here. You said a lot about a lot and I really appreciate it. Too much it. about not enough. Oh, no, not at all. I love talking. Always to you a pleasure. Love oh, when I you love join me. To you. So, so happy you were available today. I was like, please be available today. I want to talk today. That's my impulsiveness. Like, no, I want to talk to, I want to talk to Jarvis now, now. How about now? So I'm glad it worked out. I'm always delighted. Always. Always. And that is it. Jeff Jarvis. Love that conversation. Love our conversations. I also had a great conversation with a guy named David Orr, who's been on the show a couple times before, but it's got to be one of the most brilliant people 
I have ever met in my life, and he has got this great initiative that you'll be hearing me uh, talk about next week, uh, and a book and a video series that goes along with it. Democracy Unchained is the book, and the whole initiative you can get to, and I highly recommend it, is stateofamericandemocracy.org. David Orr will be my special guest on Monday's show. All right, out of time. Got to get this baby posted. Thank you for supporting it with your paid subscription. I hope you had a good week and are going to have a good weekend. And I look forward to seeing you in the Discord chat. So if you haven't signed up for that yet, you ought to. And you just have to have a subscription. And you're automatically in there. You need any directions? Let me know. We're looking forward to welcoming more of you into that community, which helps us stay connected, helps not feel alone, and always reminds each and every one of us that, come on, there's a lot of love to be had. Here's mine to you. Love you. I'll talk to you tomorrow.